Okay, welcome to the service, Philippians chapter 3, verse 15 through 19. Let's read the passage and we'll start the sermon. Ready? Go. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Amen. Father, as we continue our series in Philippians, please give us this undivided attention to your words so we can all together praise you and worship you through this sermon. Even a preacher is a worshiper. So please give me and everyone else in this sermon solely focus on your words, not a human speech or anything else. Thank you for your blessings upon us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Okay, we started off our first week in this um, the new year only Jesus right and then the last week we did person who knows Jesus as their Lord he is our Lord right and today's passage who do you follow who do you imitate who do you have fellowship with you can put many different sentences or questions here but main theme is who do you follow and who do you have around you To do that, let's go back to verse 13. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So whatever happened, I don't really pay too much attention to um those past events but I'm fixed my eyes are fixed on the goals ahead of me that I see through Christ Jesus so that was his goal that's his objective in his life and he's sharing this and it starts with let those of us who are mature think this way meaning guys what I told you just now Let's think this way, because it's beneficial for everyone. Mature, that word has different meanings. It can mean perfect or perfection in different contexts. But in this context, mature is a better uh, translation. So ESV did a good job here. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. It's not my job. Paul is speaking. God will reveal that also to you. So keep praying, keep reading the Bible, and meditate on it, and have good fellowship with other Christians. Then you will understand what I am saying here. And verse 16, as a recommendation here, only let us hold true to what we have attained. All right? Sometimes some things you don't understand, but God will eventually reveal that to you. So, what can we do now? For now, only let us hold true to what we have attained for now. Even though our eyes are fixated to the future goal, we're supposed to just reside in what we have now, up to this point, what we have obtained, right? And verse 12 says this, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, the mature thing, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So he's saying, okay, I'm going to press on. 
I'm going to continue as a mature Christian. And it continues. Verse 17 says, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. So if you just jump to this um, verse 17, it sounds like, okay, what I do, who I am, just imitate me, guys. That's not what he's saying. I'm going to explain to you a little more. But what it means is, first of all, join in imitating me. So he's not just asking one person individually imitate himself or Paul. He's saying joint imitator. You have to become a joint imitator with other fellow Christians because people are already doing it. So you're supposed to imitate me with other people. If you think about our lives, we all follow someone or something in our lives. Right? I mean, if you, if you think about it, we do. And some people have mentor or, oh, yeah, I, I respect my father, I respect my mother, or she was a motivator. You hear those testimonial statements and testimonies many occasions. In many occasions, successful people say, oh, yeah. I respect this person, that person, including some teachers in their grade school and college or professors, somebody who had a huge influence in their lives. They mentioned those people, sometimes friends or famous people and other world views from the media these days. And we talk about this one many, many times, but some people watch YouTube video of a five minute lecture or certain somebody's ideas and they believe that is a truth so it's hugely impacting their idea about anything anything of course there's all somebody nope i just follow my own thoughts and instincts they say that it sounds very smart or is it i don't know <laughs> so um if you think about this statement we're saying, okay, where did your uh, thoughts and instincts come from? How did it form in the first place? When you're born as a newborn baby, you couldn't even speak a word in anything, any language. You learned those things. You somehow formed your thoughts in your head based on your experience and education. So the fact that you're saying, I just follow my own instincts and thoughts, that is not a smart thing to say. Definitely, you are influenced by something. And Paul said, imitate me, right? Brothers, join in imitating me together. You guys have to imitate me. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Not just me, but some other people who are imitating me or mature Christians. It may sound pretentious, just looking at this sentence. However, He's not saying what he's saying here. We have to look at the context and also other parts of the Bible, what he mentioned similar things about imitating someone. All right, imitate me. Napoleon uh, Bonaparte, right, right there, he said, follow me, right? There's no, uh, nothing like impossibility or whatever have you, not in my dictionary. That's what he said. But Paul, we all know he's a spiritual leader. He's not saying, imitate me and follow me. He's saying, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Meaning, I am following in imitating Christ. You got to imitate me of doing that. Because you don't see Christ anymore like I did. And that's what he's saying. By looking at Paul and other mature Christians, following Christ in their lives, other Christians, new believers, for example, they will be able to follow Christ through them as well, through their teachings of the scriptures, through their personal lives as well. They're different. So you're not looking at Paul following Jesus Jesus is right there. 
the big one, the Lord, and we're all following him. We're not following each other. We're following Jesus, right? And it says this, okay, so up to this point, we have mature Christians, and Paul saying, follow me, imitating in me, and join them, right? And look at other examples. So some are walking with other believers and spiritually maturing in Christ. At the same time, other people do something different. Verses 18 through 19. Verse 18 says, For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. When the Bible says walk, that's a literal translation of the word, the Hebrew word and Greek word. But that means living. Right? They're living. They live as enemies of the cross of Christ. They may say otherwise. They may say, I love Christ, but their life does not reflect that. And he says, he's not judging anyone. He's just saying that this is what's going to happen to them. As we speak today, for example, January 17th in 2021, if somebody's lifestyle fits in this description, then this is the, the end result of their life, unless God touches their heart and regenerate their heart so they can come back to the Lord. So their end, their end is destruction. Their God, small g, their God is, their idol, is their belly. Their belly. They say, I care about other people who are poor. I care about those people who are in um, hunger, right, in need of help. But their God is their own belly. They may say whatever they want to say, but their life doesn't reflect that. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Clarification. We have to study. We have to work. We have to have some break, vacation. That's for sure. We're not saying stop altogether and go up to the mountain and pray and read the Bible all the days of your lives. That's not what we're saying. If their God, main thing, their main goal is filling up their own belly and they do whatever it takes to achieve that goal, always thinking about the earthly things, they're the ones walking as enemies of the cross of Christ. So let's think about Paul, the Apostle Paul. After he met Christ, the conversion experience took place and then he became a completely different person. So his passion, as we read from other verses, he just pressed on preaching and teaching the Word of God sincerely. That's all he has. That's his goal. He's caring for other people's soul. But the result, some people walk in the light, but some people didn't. So that's uh, the lesson we have to learn from this one. Sometimes you try to um, spread a gospel to other people, evangelize your friend, your family members. They can flat out reject your a gospel message. It happens. It's not about us, right, as a messenger. It's all about God and the power of his uh, words. So it can be disappointing if you look at yourself, but you shouldn't be. But that with tears, that also hurts my heart. When I read it, mm, it was not a good uh, verse to read and meditate on it. Because when you read this type of verses, if you have experience of dealing with people sincerely, and when you see the way they live now, it hurts. Because you care about them, right? 
So what's the meaning of enemies of the cross of Christ? We have different type of people in this world, but it's not just referring to the people who persecuted Christians. Knowingly and willingly persecuting Christians, we, that's for sure. We all know that. But these are the people who are in church. Who's going to receive and read Paul's letter? Think about it. The people in Philippi, right? So-called Christians. They will be the ones who are reading this letter. So if you're an unbeliever, don't even go to church and don't care about the church matters, you're not going to even have a chance to read this, the letter back then, right? 2,000 years ago. So Paul is saying this. You guys, some of you, are walking and living as enemies of Christ of the Christ. That hurts. That really hurts. And who are those people? Romans chapter 8 says this, for those who live according to the flesh, so it compares the, the people according to the flesh and according to the spirit, two different type of people. For those who live according to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For, please note here, to set the mind of the flesh is death. Right? The destruction that Paul mentioned earlier. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. So just because you are working on the things that you just care about other than God, if you only care about, only mindful about the earthly things, then you are enemies of God. You're hostile to God without persecuting Christians, right? For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. You just don't have anything in your heart about God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. They, of course they cannot, right? And unfortunately, these people, because, you no, know, I go to church, you know, I attend a, the Bible study, you know, I love those Christian brothers and sisters. They say it, but unfortunately, they don't even realize that they are the enemies and um, of God. That's really sad. And if you know that oh, what you're doing is not the right thing to do, then there's hope. You may come back. You may realize, okay, this is not the right direction. Then let me change. Turn around and go back to the Lord. But if you don't know that you're going to the wrong direction, you may accelerate. Go faster to that direction, wrong direction. One time I was in um, Virginia, you know, if you go to uh, 66 West and you hit uh, 81, I went south. I don't know where I went, but I was coming up to back home, right, Fairfax, Virginia. So I have to go up to the north of 81, and I was going fast. Yep. And I just you know, went on and on, and I thought that was the right direction. And, of course, I saw the sign says, Welcome to West Virginia. Oops, I passed the exit i missed the exit i have to turn around and go back if you don't know you're going to the wrong direction it's tough you may not listen to anybody else so pray to god to give you the open heart open mind so you can listen to the word of god sensitively And the reason why they cannot please God is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. It says, and without faith, it is impossible to please him, meaning these people are not believers, unfortunately. Okay. And it extends to all aspects of our lives, right? It's not just me doing something. It shows in every aspect of our lives. Good example is from Matthew chapter 6. It says, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. A lot of people do this. 
I'm not saying, oh, you can pray one or two minutes and you're going to have a deep conversation with God. No, that's not what I'm saying. But people are paying so much attention about the length of prayer and the words that they use. Of course, you've got to be careful. But they just want to say things that they don't say usually. A lot of big words, expressions that they never, they never use in their regular conversation. And trying to impress other people. That's interesting. So I want to ask those question, this question to those people. When you do that, are you relying on God or your own prayer? Man, that was good prayer. Well, think twice. You should rely on God, not your own prayer and your words. That's what the Bible says here. Jesus said. And also, therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear, for the Gentiles seek after all these things. The Gentiles here is the, the people, referring to the people who don't believe in God, right? So these, of course, we have to do. We're all concerned about everything, right? That is for sure. But we are going to be different. We have a different priority. And we're supposed to walk in the light with God, even though sometimes it bothers us that we don't have something to eat or drink. I mean, not literally, but in many occasions, we have some concerns coming to our direction, right? But we have to go above and beyond that concern of ours. Okay. You must heard this expression before. It says, if it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck, then it probably is a duck. Anybody has any questions about this? Right? Most likely that's how you describe it. It is a duck, I would say. If someone exhibits unbelievers characteristics, way of spending time and resources, and the world view. The, the things that they speak, the, the things that they think, the things that they believe, the value of life and the worth, everything fits unbelievers' description. Then most likely, that person is an unbeliever. You can come to church every day, but everything in your life shows as an unbeliever, then you are unbeliever. Let us go through some examples here. If you're a true Christian, I mentioned it earlier, if you want to marry somebody, you are going to find a believer. That's a main criteria, so to speak. You're not going to go to uh, different religious gatherings and then say, okay, I want to meet this Buddhist uh, lady for my, my marriage. Um, if you're a true Christian, you may not do that. Not that those people are bad. What That's not what I'm saying. But you may just look into your church or community of believers to find your spouse. Right? Usually, we have... 100% agreement on this. 100%. Work. When you change your job, not many people actually ask this question. Surprisingly, will it affect my spiritual life? Meaning, if you know that you have to work every Sunday, you cannot make the service on time, every Sunday, knowingly, I don't think I'm going to apply for that job. If I'm a doctor and nurse, I sometimes have a shift, so I have to work like twice a, twice a month on Sundays. Right. Those things I have to, it's a you know, life or death situation. I have to help out some other people, emergency situation. Yes. That may work. But not every Sunday. Right? 
I, I don't know how much they're gonna pay you by doing that, but it doesn't really matter. But people say, well, but still, I still have to get a job, and that's the only choice. And instead of having 100% agreement like this, it starts going down, the percentage of agreement. Okay. So if you want to go with that route, that's fine, even though I don't really agree with that. When it comes down to social issues, political issues, and other matters in life, approaching with biblical principles is perceived as ignorant. Even within a Christian community, people say, whoa, why do you have to bring the Bible to politics, the social issues, equality issues, equity, and all those great issues that Bible doesn't really mention? Really? Think twice on that too. So amazingly, other than a few items in our lives, most of the items, Christians don't agree with one another. And they use their own logic, their own thoughts, their own background, their own education, instead of the Bible. So if you do that, somehow do not agree with the Bible, you have some serious issues if you really care about your spiritual status where you are. So some people say, okay, yeah, marriage, 100% agree. But other things, I cannot really agree with that, what the Bible teaches. Really, why does it have to be in that uh, place, biblical principles in social issues, for example? So I agree certain areas of the Bible, I, but I do not agree other with other principles or teachings of the Bible. When you say something like this, when you hear somebody saying this, please remember this. So this is from the dictionary, online dictionary, Latin um, heresis, school sect belief contrary to church dogma, which is different from church teachings, right? Borrowed from Greek heresis, act of taking choice, course of action or thought, system of principles, sect faction, from Herain to take, grasp, obtain, choose. You're picking and choosing what to agree and what not to agree with what the Bible teaches. Yes, I agree with some, but I cannot agree other uh, with other principles. That means you're heretic. That's the very definition of heresy. Picking and choosing. Be very careful. If somebody doesn't know anything about this, they may say, oh yeah, that's reasonable, that's how we think. You know, We have to all uh, embrace and agree and things and agree to disagree sometimes, right? Right. In the worldly matters, we can do that, some small matters. But when the biblical principle can play in a role in any, any situation, we got to agree that biblical principle or teachings have supreme authority over anything that we have. Otherwise, we're committing heresies. One more time, for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Paul's teaching in today's term, it's a sermon. It's a sermon, right? And you hear the sermon every week. And this is bullet, bulletproof vest. What happens is um, bulletproof vest, if you get hit by this small bullet, I heard that people, it hurts still. You may even get in injury, right? But this is the, the main purpose of this bulletproof vest is to protect you from um, losing your life, right? Some people pass out because of the shock. But they wake up and just walk away as if nothing happened. So we have this spiritual bulletproof vest 
around us. Sermons and teachings, the word of God, they come at you. It hurts you. But unfortunately, if you still wear this bulletproof vest, it cannot change you. You got to pray to God and take off this bulletproof vest, your spiritual bulletproof vest. So you are open to the Word of God working in you because the Word of God is active and live. So this is the description, the followers of Christ, the enemies of Christ. And question is, who would you imitate and walk with? Please think through this. I have one more slide, but I'm not going to share it with you. And this is the conclusion. You have to make a decision. Even though God does fulfill his words, his promises, He's asking us to respond properly, positively, openly, and sensitively. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for giving us another opportunity to worship you. As Paul mentioned in his letter, in general, we have two different groups of people, especially in church. One group is maturing in Christ and having a fellowship with other Christians and always look at the things through the glass of biblical principles. Another group is the one who attends church involved with the same activities, but still they keep the worldly values and always thinking about the earthly things more than the church matters and what the Bible teaches. Father, we pray for those people who still are wandering around in this world spiritually. Even though they are preached and taught the Word of God, they still don't open their heart. Please, Lord, help them to open their hearts so they can have great fellowship with you and with us. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you from now and forevermore. Amen.